Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that once he finally got his ducks in a row, they flew south for the winter. He is the captain. Well, having some ducks as pets is not all that it's quacked up to be. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Duck Pin Pale Ale by Union Craft Brewing Company in Baltimore Garage Grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. This is a generously hopped pale ale brewed with lots of Pacific, Northwest, and New Zealand hops. And my favorite part, Duck Pin has big citrus and tropical fruit aroma. You have aroma. And Duck Pin was brought to us by, first up we have Amira in Santa Monica, California. Another frisky bugger. We have Bex over in Leeds, UK. Next up, we have Berto in Waterford, Michigan. And a big we like your jib to Jess in Oklahoma. And we are sending a long distance cheers to Katie and Isaac in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And last but not least, we have Kimberly right here in beautiful gray Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ohio. And it pains me to say this, but they did win last night, so... Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Thank you to everybody for helping us with this week's beer run. If you want to help us out with next week's, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And there you can find our blog, our old episodes, and bonus episodes. You can also find the old episodes and bonus episodes on iTunes. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. following is a letter written and sent from a Maryland prison. You are always asking me about my murders. Well, here is one that no one knows about. That's right, pal. I have never told anyone about this murder. I never had to go far to find a victim, for most all truck stops across the U.S. had whores working in and around them. This is a story of a young prostitute I killed in October of 1995. She was working the 76 truck stop in Reno, Nevada. I was driving a blue long-nosed Peterbilt. I was hooked up to a freezer trailer. That's a trailer with a freezer. 
I beat and raped that bitch in the sleeper of that truck that night until I grew tired of her. Then I put my hands on her neck and I began squeezing. Her screams of pain slowly dwindled down to mere rasp of agonizing grunts and groans. The sounds she made slowly faded away, never to be heard again. Sweet death had finally come down upon her. Now her body was just a dead carcass, laying in wait for the decomposition to start, the breaking down of cells. I laid there with my arms wrapped around her dead body and slept for about three hours. I woke up to my alarm clock going off at 5.30 a.m. I climbed over her and I got dressed. I throwed a blanket over her. Then I started the truck up. I got out of the truck, locked the door, and headed over to the coffee shop to grab a bite and check the computer for loads heading east. The closest thing I saw available to me that I was looking for was a load of ranch house salad dressing they wanted taken down to Houston, Texas. The company was located over in Sharps, Nevada, which is only about 25 miles north of the truck stop. I decided to accept the job. I grabbed a coffee to go and off to the truck I went. I climbed up into the cab and checked everything out and off I go. I got to the warehouse in Sharps that had the load but there was no one there because it was Saturday morning. The sign on the door said they were opened up at 9 a.m., but it was only 7.45 a.m. So I looked around, and there wasn't a damn soul in sight. There wasn't nothing around this little business park. So I thought, this would be a perfect place to ditch her off. I dragged her dead ass out of the truck. I grabbed my little army shovel, and off I went to the back of that little warehouse. I found a nice isolated area back there. I buried her in about 45 minutes. This industrial park wasn't very old, so the ground was pretty soft. And that's where she is to this day. It was not for another two bodies later that I would realize what a waste of all that good meat was, only ending up being nothing more than bug and worm food. I have never shed a tear for those I have killed, nor will I down the road. Those sweet, young, drug-addicted prostitutes that I killed back in my past were pretty much dead to the world long before I killed them. They were nothing more than walking zombies, looking for a few moments of pleasure from their sick, twisted daily lives of shame. I feel I've done those poor souls a favor. If I feel anything for them... I feel only some jealousy, for their pains are over, and mine will continue as I sit behind these bars until the day I die. I have enclosed my tooth for you. We never met, but now you will always have a part of me with you. You take care. Be safe out there, my best friend. Signed with a thumbprint, pressed in blood. December 8th, 1996, Baltimore, Maryland. And Captain, while I would consider the great state of Maryland to be a beautiful, beautiful state and Baltimore to be a beautiful city as well, while I would not consider the couple of city blocks where our story starts off to be anywhere near beautiful. Shout out to Rockville, Maryland. (laughs) This is a dingy, undesirable couple of city blocks on the city's southwest side. Back in December of 1996, Joe Metheny is 46 years old. He's about six foot one inches tall and almost 300 pounds. So we're talking about a pretty big guy here. Big boy. On the night of the 8th, he met a woman by the name of Rita Kemper, who is 37 years old. He met her at the Borderline Bar. Now, Joe is at this bar nearly every night drinking beer in Southern Comfort. 
The bar is right by where Joe Metheny works. Joe works for the Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company. Mm -hmm. For those of you that may not know, pallets are those wood skids manufactured primarily for stacking cargo when loading, you know, onto semi trucks or trains. Anyway, not only does Joe work there, but he is living there. So I'll ex- I'll explain. Joe is a forklift operator at the Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company. Mm-hmm. He's a forklift operator by day, but by night he is a night watchman. Joe is a well, let's say he's a very persuasive personality. He's outgoing. He's quite the talker. So my guess is Joe had nowhere to live, and he cut a deal with his boss. You know, you need someone to watch this place at night. And I work here during the day. You know me. You trust me. So they work out this deal. I think they only paid him an additional $20 a week for his night watchman duties. Right. But he got to stay there and sleep there at night. The Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company is located at 3200 James Street, which is in the southwest corner of the city of Baltimore. The company is situated on a lot which is adjacent to a wooded area. The company has a locked entrance gate and is surrounded by an eight foot high chain link fence with barbed wire on top. The lot is approximately the size of a city, a square city block. There is a warehouse and an office building there that is surrounded by literally thousands of wooden pallets, which are stacked at varying heights throughout the lot. There is no business conducted at this company or surrounding companies during the evening hours. James Street is a dead-end street where there is very little to no pedestrian traffic. Joe lived in a small one-room trailer located on the south fence. The nearest residential development to the pallet company is approximately two blocks away. On this particular night, apparently his watchman duties included inviting Rita Kemper back to his trailer. From the bar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rita had joined Joe at the trailer on at least one other occasion. Now, I don't know the particulars of that visit, but I do know the particulars of this one, and it goes like this. Joe invited Rita back to join him at the trailer with the promise of drinks and cocaine. Well, at some point, Joe starts attacking Rita. She manages to get out of the trailer. She raced towards the front gate, but Joe is chasing after her. Rita Kemper reached the gate, but it was locked. When she turned around to look for another way out, Joe had caught up to her Mm -hmm. and he punched her. His big fat fist smashing into her jaw, rendering her unconscious. Joe then dragged her back into the trailer by her hair. Once Joe had Rita back in the trailer, he pinned her down, which is probably pretty easy for him once he got on top of her to hold her down. I mean, he's almost 300 pounds at this time. I don't know the size of this poor woman, but I'm guessing she's outsized by quite a bit. Once pinned down, Joe starts pulling down Rita's jeans. She starts screaming. Joe yells at her. Um, and she's yelling at Joe, but Joe's not terribly worried about the screams because where this is located, where the trailer is located, this lot it's it's likely that not anyone would hear her, especially at this hour of night. I mean, like you said, there's no pedestrians walking by. Correct. And there's no business being conducted in this area at this hour. Rita begs Joe to stop attacking her. He ignores her. She starts praying out loud and Joe's reaction to this, well, he he finds this to be funny. Then Joe tells Rita that he's going to rape her, and when he's done, he's going to kill her, and once she is dead, he is going to bury her in the woods with the other girls. Rita Kemper decides that she is not going to die, not that night, not by the hands of this loser. Well, she started kicking, and she kicked her legs out of her pants. Remember, he was trying to pull the pants off. Right. And he she rolled underneath of Joe as he was trying to keep her pinned down. This rolling allows her to break free. Now she's on her feet and she's sprinting out of the trailer and looking for a way out of the fenced in yard. Now Joe is up and he's running after her and he still got her pants in his hand. Rita ran toward one of several large stacks of pallets. Now there are hundreds of course of these pallets There are probably, you know, piles and stacks of these things all along the fences. 
Rita starts climbing one of these stacks. Joe runs up to the stack. She's climbing and he's trying to grab her as she continues to climb. I mean, this is like a scene out of a horror movie. Rita feels Joe's hand nearly grab her ankle. She gets to the top of the stack and she leaps, jumping over the top of the fence. She slams to the ground, but thankfully on the other side of the fence from Joe Metheny. She gets back on her feet and runs down the hill, screaming and waving her hands. She's trying to flag down a vehicle. Then she sees the lights of an approaching car. Am I wrong? I mean, that's like the ending of the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? Waving down a vehicle. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have this woman who it seems like if you, if you looked in on this area, it would feel like there was nothing around this trailer and nothing around this fenced in pallet yard. Yeah. She's basically trapped with inside that fence, figuring out this masterful way to get out leaping over the fence. And now she's free, but she's still got this maniac inside the fence trying to get to her. Yeah. And you just wanted a little bananas and blow. And, uh, now you're jumping over fences. Well, she's outside the fence. She's trying to flag down a car. She sees a car. This car starts to slow down. And to her surprise, it's a police officer. She tells the officer what had just happened and how she was attacked and how Joe had told her that he was going to rape and kill her. The officer drives up the hill and around to the front of the gate. Joe is inside the fence near the gate and in his hands, he still has a hold of Rita's pants. The officer orders Joe out and into his car. Joe spent the night in jail and he was going to be charged with assault, kidnapping, and attempted rape. But the thing here is though, Captain, they didn't hold him long. He was not going to have to stay in jail for very long to wait for the trial. Right. No. And, and, and he also knows where his victim, you know, goes to hang out. He knows probably her friends, maybe knows where she lives. Yeah, and I, I, I'm guessing she won't be returning to the borderline bar anytime soon, right. especially with him being out. So they, Well, I'm pointing out that the police are not protecting her. Right. And they end up releasing him. It's just a day or two after this attack. So when Joe gets out, guess where he is, Captain? Goes to the bar. That's right. He's right back at the borderline bar, sitting on a stool, drinking Southern comfort and beer, telling jokes. Mm. Now, not too long after being released from jail, Joe is back at the bar. And on this particular night, he's hanging out with a guy named William Ashbrook Jr. Now, William works with Joe at the pallet company. They are at the borderline bar. Most of the night boozing it up. Joe invites William back to well, the trailer. Just to be clear. There's no crime or shame in that. And boozing it up with with your buddy from the pallet company. No, I mean just being at a bar and boozing it up. Right, right. So Joe invites William back to the trailer. They get to the trailer and they start snorting cocaine. That's a crime. <laughs> okay, thanks for the clarification. Just to let you know. And after a few snorts, Joe asks William for a favor. <laughs> Sorry. Joe... Go ahead. <laughs> no, I almost choked on my beer. Joe tells William that he needs I think it's help. It's in the line after a few lines, not a, after a few snorts. few snorts? <laughs> we're, cha we're changing the okay. lingo. After a few snorts, continue. Yeah. Joe asks William, William for a favor. He wants help moving a body, and he thinks maybe William would help him with this. Uh, William thinks Joe is messing around with him. He doesn't believe Joe. So Joe then takes William into the woods and Joe starts pushing away debris and trash. And underneath this debris and trash, sure enough, there is a rotting nude body of a dead woman. William tells Joe that he's going to vomit and that he's not going to help him move the body. Yeah. He does offer to go get more cocaine. Yeah, and I, I wonder when he's saying, hey, look, I'm going to puke. I can't help you. I wonder what Joe's demeanor was at this time. Was he getting angry at him? Did he sense, uh, you know, did he feel threatened? Like, if I don't help him, is he going to attack me? Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder. And I, I almost feel like we have Joe Metheny at this point that's got probably so much beer and Southern comfort and cocaine in him. 
right. he might even be very casual about this whole thing. Yeah. Hey, you want, you want to go help me move this body? Well, I like this little escape plan that, that William has here. He's like, yeah. I'm not going to help you move the body, but I'll go get some more cocaine for the both of us. Yeah. Well, with this, he leaves and he does not come back that night. The next day, I'm not sure if this is at work. Remember, they work together or if this was at the bar after work. But William asked Joe about the body that he was asked to help move. Joe plays dumb and acts like he doesn't know what William is talking about. Right. Well, William starts to get scared of his friend Joe. He starts getting scared of this stuff that he knows. He starts thinking, you know, if if I know about this dead body that Joe showed me, maybe I'm the only one that knows about it. Well, Joe could easily take me out and then nobody knows about this body, right? Yeah. So eventually, just within a couple of days, William reports the story to the police. On December 15th, 1996, at approximately 1.40 a.m., members of the Baltimore City Police Department and an FBI task force arrest Joe Metheny. Get this. They arrested Joe at the Joe Stein and Sons Company Christmas party. And it does not take them long to find a dead body. Just 10 feet from the trailer that Joe slept in, yeah. they find the body of a woman who who was wrapped up in a red tarp. And that would be the body, I'm assuming. The dead body would later be identified as Kimberly Lynn Spicer, age 26. So after he is arrested, a Baltimore police officer transported him to the homicide unit of the police department. During the course of the in investigation of the recovered body of Kim Spicer, Joe gave several statements to detectives but he starts telling them about someone other than Kim Spicer. He tells them he met a woman about two years ago. He described the woman as possibly having brown hair. Her build, according to Joe, was she was a little thin and she was a little tall in stature. He believes this would have been one night back in right. July 1994. Joe is very judgmental. Yeah, uh, he says that this would have been around 8 or 9 p.m. that night. Mm -hmm. He tells the officers that he took this woman to his trailer located at the pallet company. And while in his trailer, he had sex with her while she was partially clothed. She had been in his trailer for approximately one hour when Joe started to strangle her. When the detective asked Joe Metheny, how did you strangle her? Did you strangle her with your hands? Metheny responded, yes, with my hands. The detective further questioned, did you use anything else? To which he answered, I used an, ex an extension cord. Yeah. I took the end of the cord and strangled her. To clarify, he's saying that he choked her with his hands until she passed out. Once she passed out, he put the extension cord around her neck and killed her. Then according to Joe, he drug her back into the woods, then buried her in a shallow grave he then took her purse and clothing and buried them in a separate location. Now, we said that Joe did not know the woman's name, but he gave identifying information stating that he believed that the victim's first name was possibly Kathy and that she was approximately five foot six to five foot seven and about 120 to 130 pounds. She was also missing a couple of upper front teeth. She had been wearing cut off jeans, white tennis shoes, and a white pullover sweater, and she had a purse with her. And like you said, he's he's basically living on the property of his work, mm -hmm. and it's a fenced-in property, and so it's a big area. But outside that fence is where he's been burying these individuals. Yeah, so there's he, there's that wooded area. So he's going to draw a diagram of what he can, re, you know, best remember to try to help them locate uh, this victim. Yes, they're go they're going to look for where he buried the body. He says it would have been a shallow grave. He said approximately two feet deep. He further stated that when he buried her, she was not dressed. Additionally, Joe indicated that after the body had been buried for about six months, he went back to the burial location and dug up and removed the skull. Afterwards, he threw the skull in a trash box. Why? Why did he do that? Um... I mean, does it say? Yeah, well, he, in his words, I and mean, actually I should, I should clarify. 
I don't know if these are his words. Maybe a reporter cleaned it up. Right. But from the report that I read, he dug up the skull that had been there for approximately six months, cleaned it, and then made love to it. Mm. Uh, Romantic. He, yeah. And then he, he threw the skull in a trash box. The box containing the skull was later removed from that location and transported to, according to Joe, Oxford, Pennsylvania. So he must know where this trash is being sent to. Yeah. And basically he's telling you, you're going to find this body roughly in this area on the diagram that I drew. You're going to find a naked woman, headless naked, naked woman. Yeah. Well, also if you're living in this, you know, work compound basically, and you know, when trash is leaving, then this is a great way for you to be able to hide evidence. Right. He should have probably put the whole thing in the, you know, in this trash box that would have been transported far away. Right. But for whatever reason, he felt more comfortable burying her in that shallow grave in the woods. So the next day, the police took Joe in cuffs and shackles back to the pallet company, escorted by Detective Pennington. This is one of the detectives that was involved in the questioning of Joe. They took him there for the purpose of pointing out where he had buried the female victim. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Hey, parents. Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. All right. Cheers, mates. So we're talking about Joe Metheny, mm-hmm. the killer. Um, not to be confused with like somebody like Pat Metheny. They're they're spelled the same way, but and if you look up some reports, they will say Joe Metheny, right. but it's actually Joe Metheny. Yeah, we got that from local Baltimore reports. So him being from Baltimore, we're going with that with that pronunciation. So where we left off, Captain, they had returned Joe to the pallet company in hopes of finding this buried female victim that Joe had told the investigators about. Now, on that first day, 
The search team was unsuccessful in locating the body. Joe could not seem to show them the right spot. And there had been a good deal of rain around that time. So they brought in cadaver dogs to pick up a scent. However, possibly due to all this rain, they were unable to find the location. So finding nothing, they had to call off the search and then later again get permission to remove Joe from the Baltimore City Detention Center. With permission granted, Detective Pennington again transported Joe back to the Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company to assist locating the body. This time, after some hesitation, Metheny indicated to detectives there's an area approximately just 10 feet from a previous location that he had pointed out to them. Okay, so bring in the excavation team, right? Uh -huh. The team used techniques to carefully unearth the remains, and they were exactly, exactly in the condition that Joe said that they would be. The doctor at the excavation site noted that the cranium was missing. The skeletal remains were recovered from a very shallow grave and transported to the office of the chief medical examiner, where later, with dental records, the remains were found to be that of Catherine magaziner and Catherine would have been 45 at the time of her murder. Yeah. And I know it's a bit confusing captain because we said that the cranium was missing, but remember the body had been buried for approximately six months. So when Joe dug up the body and took the skull, the lower jaw by this time had already fallen off. Mm -hmm. The lower jaw was located with the rest of the body and that's what they use to get the dental records. And they're also going to be able to determine that Joe was telling the truth when he said that her death was by strangulation. Yes. And here's a little thing here. Joe was asked why he had killed Kathy. He said that it gave him a sense of power stating. I don't know. I got a rush out of it. I got high out of it. Yeah. Adding call it what you want. I had no real excuse other than I like to do it. I don't know how to describe it. So now, Captain, we have this man. We have him. He's locked up. He's been arrested. We found two bodies. He's attacked another woman that got away, thankfully. Yeah. So who is this guy? So, okay, so we but we found the one that wasn't buried. That's the one that he tried to get his co-worker to help him bury. Yes, that move was the body. Kim Spicer, she was wrapped up in a, a red tarp. Yeah, and then we found Catherine. She is buried. Buried in that wooded area near the pallet company. Both died of same cause. Uh, believed to be strangulation and both both deaths. Yes. yes, and then we have an attack. on. This was the Rita Kemper who was attacked and got away. Now, one thing I do want to point out here, Captain, regarding the cause of death with these two women is that Joe, unfortunately, he he when he attacked these women, he beat them quite a bit as well. Um, so they would have seen injuries on the bodies to indicate that as well. So who is this guy that we have locked up? You know, what can we figure out about his background? Well, we can tell that he's a real piece of shit. Well, Joe was born in Baltimore County, but lived in West Virginia from the ages of two to six later. According to Joe, pay attention to that. According to Joe, he was shuffled among foster homes and, in the Baltimore area. Mm -hmm. He completed the eighth grade, but he earned his high school equivalency and studied physics for a year and a half while in the army, where he was a field artillery soldier from 1973 to 1975. He was honorably discharged. After that, he worked at various jobs, including a shipyard, a liquor distributor, and he was also a long haul truck driver for some time. Metheny spent about 20 years in a world few people ever see. He drifted in and out of Baltimore City's homeless camps composed of filthy tents and sleeping bags under bridges and over sewer gratings. For a while, he lived in row houses under the Patapsco River Bridge in a homeless community called Tent City. Then later in 1988, he began working at the Joe Stein and Sons company where he lived in the trailer at the pallet company. Now at the pallet company, captain, according to his coworkers, Joe Metheny, he made people laugh. They said he would joke about anything and his bosses at work stated he was a pretty smart guy. He would come up with solutions to problems stating that 
if we had a problem, he would be the one that would come up with a way to figure it out. But these same coworkers described a complex personality, many of them saying in one respect, he is a gentle giant that they nicknamed tiny standing more than six feet tall, weighing almost 300 pounds, stating that he loves to draw large cartoon characters and play video games. So he Uh, sounds kind of like a big kid. Yeah, but enough with this. uh, We we call the big guy tiny. Let's come up with some better names. than that. (laughs) That, That does happen a lot. But but here's where the complex personality comes into play. They state that he also had a temper and at times had threatened co-workers and also threatened patrons of the bar where he hung out nearly every night playing pool. Does it right? But does it say what kind of threats? Cause there's a difference between, Hey man, I'm going to kick your ass and Hey man, I'm going to kill you. Uh, I don't have any specifics. Threats, right? I don't have okay. any specifics, just coworkers stating that they were aware that he had threatened them at times, as well as people at this bar. Well, and I think also because you're living at your job, then you know that, you know, if you make these threats and then your employer comes down on you, not only do you lose your job, you're going to lose your home. Mm -hmm. Well, he also drank very heavily. According to the people that knew him, they believe that he went through a bottle of Southern comfort whiskey each and every night, whether it be at the bar or back at the rundown trailer that was furnished simply with two chairs, a couch and a television set and an electric heater. He, Joe, had surrounded the trailer with stacks of pallets. Metheny told his attorney that he was one of six children born into a poor family and that he was neglected as a child and shuffled off to foster homes by his parents and telling his attorney by the time of his arrest, both his parents were dead. Okay, now, Captain, as you know, we are about to get into our first discrepancy in this serial killer profile case. Okay. Because here we try, as we did with Ted Bundy and John Gacy, to study their crimes, their backgrounds, and their words to try to get a better sense of who these killers are, why they did what they did, and what made them this way. Now, Joe, I wouldn't consider to be a human in any sense, that we can see from the crimes that we have already discussed. You can see he's just an evil waste of life. But when we look at Joe's crimes, his background, and especially his words to try to figure him out, this is where we run into one major problem. Joe would later in life tell us a lot about his crimes and background. But at some point, we have to start to wonder how much of this that he is telling us is true. Among other things, he told his lawyer that his mother was dead, which came as a surprise to his mother. Right. He says both of his parents are dead. Well, presto changeo, Captain Joe's mom is alive. So not only did he get that wrong or lie, but his mother's recollections contradict some of Joe's statements. All right. So what does his mother say? His mother was tracked down by a reporter at her home in Markleysburg, Pennsylvania. Her name is Jean Metheny. And at the time of this, she was 78 years young. When the reporter tracked her down, uh, she... You mean old? Yeah. Well, both. Uh, When she was told that her son, Joe, described her as dead, she responded, maybe he just wishes I was. Right. Adding that he pushed his family away a long time ago. Gene Metheny described her son uh, as growing up to be a normal boy, saying he was smart and he had a good childhood. She said this, and this next statement should, shouldn't should make me laugh, but it does. Gene said if Joe was neglected, it was his own fault. She, <laughs> right. That, that just, does that seem weird or what? That sounds neglectful. Yeah. Sounds, hey, if uh, you were neglected, it's your own damn fault. Yeah. She said that their home was a pretty good one, adding that none of her children were ever placed in other homes. But if it wasn't a good home, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> Jean Metheny, she said her husband was a laborer. The two of them struggled to make ends meet and moved to the North Point Boulevard area of Essex shortly before Joe Metheny was born. When Joe was six, his father was killed in a car accident. She said his death was very, very hard on the family. Right. Jean had to work to support the family. She said that she did everything she could to keep the children together. And the years after her husband's death, 
Jean says she worked as a waitress, a barmaid, and as a canteen truck driver who delivered lunches to workers at Sparrows Point Shipyard. She said she could not be with her family every single minute of the day, but it was a normal family. She said, we weren't rich, but we always had something to eat and we always had a roof over our heads. And that becomes a difficult situation because the father at that time, especially in that time period, he probably was the breadwinner. And now she's going to have to take on these jobs. And a lot of times you'd see that the mother would stay at home and raise the, the children while the father can focus on his career. Mm-hmm. And so she might not have built up some of those skills. So she would have to take on jobs like being a waitress or something that wouldn't pay her as much per hour. So she wouldn't be working that normal 40 hour weeks, be working 60 hours a week. Well, not only that captain, I'm guessing that when she mentions that she has, you know, at times she worked as a waitress or a barmaid or the truck driver. Right. I'm also wondering because they have six children and she's a single parent. If at a lot of those times, if she was working more than one of those jobs, Together. No, that's what I mean. I, I'm a, I'm assuming that she's working anywhere from 60 to 70 hours. Right. right. And that, you know, is that a normal childhood? For some people, yeah. But, you know, you have six kids. Then where did they go? Who's watching them? Yeah, and I mean, I don't mean to attack Jean here. Not, no, not um, at all. Not but, at all. But I do question where, where I hear her say that she's working all these jobs it seems to me like maybe neglected is not that big of a stretch. Well, no, because in her defense, she's doing everything she can to put food on the table, keep the lights on. So that's not, you know, it's not neglect. Right. Right. Maybe that's the wrong word. What, what I'm getting at though, is we have one parent gone who passed away. I'm just saying that we have another that's, that may not be home hardly ever. And yeah. And we all know how tough it can be to live in a, a single, a parent home. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then especially in this time to have a single mother home, you know, so I applaud her for putting the family on her shoulders and trying to do what she can. She did go on to tell us that she and the family never went on welfare. And she remembers her son, Joe, as an avid bike rider and an above average student and adding that he was always polite. Well, if you're scoring at home, trying to keep track of Joe's, lies or truths um so dad dead yes check mom not dead no check for joe but maybe dead in his mind Mm -hmm. she did agree that uh that joe did serve you know that joe spent time serving this great country Mm -hmm. uh in our nation's military and gives some detail stating that when he turned 18 in 1973 joe entered the army and was stationed in germany where he met a woman that he seemed to be very close to. We don't have any more information on this woman, but she brings him up, her up for some reason. Joe Metheny told his attorney that he served in Vietnam and became addicted to heroin during his tour of duty in the artillery unit. Right. But his mother said that she does not recall him having served in Vietnam. The articles where I found this information stated that the military records for Joseph Matheny were not available when they wrote this. I was unable to confirm if he had actually served in the war um, or if he was just stationed in Germany like his mother had said. Well, tough thing here, though, too, is, I mean, if if the death of the father was really tough on the family and then, you again, you have six kids. And then, I mean, is there any truth to the whole foster care thing? That seems to be an item that they cannot agree on. She's stating that she did everything she could to keep the children together. But and that, that doesn't they, mean that they did. That's right? true. That's, that's why I find her statement strange. Right. Because she doesn't, she doesn't definitively say, the kids were always at my house and in my care. Right. She says that she did the best that she could to keep the children together. Right. And so he goes off into the army. Maybe he served, maybe he didn't. Maybe she doesn't know because they weren't that close afterwards. I do think, um, she did at some point definitively say that they did not live at any other homes, but it it seems like a, now mind you, she's 78 when she's giving this interview. Uh, so some of these answers seem a little bit, uh, of a roundabout way of getting to them. Now, 
once he had left her home, this is according to his mother, Joseph seldom called or wrote to his mother. Right. Um, the relationship, she said, eventually disintegrated, and the two didn't speak for about 10 years, stating that he just kept drifting further and further away, and she does agree that Joe at some point developed a drug problem. Um, here's one thing I wonder about, Captain. Uh-huh. If they hadn't spoken so long, And I really wonder about Joe's drug issues. I think, I think he was a severe alcoholic and probably very addicted to drugs. Um, Right. And I'm, I'm betting that this had gone on for quite some time leading up to the point of his arrest with his mother being 78 and them not having spoke for so long. Do you think where the public would later call Joe a liar for stating that his mother is dead? Do you think there's any chance that he may have just thought she was dead that he didn't keep track with her? I mean, you're talking about a guy that he went, he woke up in the morning, probably hung over as hell and went and worked as a forklift operator and then went straight to the bar every night after work where he got wasted drunk and would do drugs if he could get his hands on them and then wake up and repeat the same thing the next day. We're not talking about somebody that's keeping tabs on family members or, or, or living any kind of normal life. Well, no contact for 10 years. So maybe at some point he's either just assuming or, like I said, I think more of that is psychologically that she's dead to me. Let's, so. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And, and I, I, obviously he has some issues with women. Well, let's get to the trials regarding the charges that Joe is facing. He was first charged with the attack on Rita Kemper. We'll call her the one that got away. This won't be a very tough trial, though. It shouldn't be at all. I mean, we have a living witness slash victim, and she ran directly from the attack and fled into the arms of a police officer. Yeah. So we have her testimony, and we have the police officer's testimony as well regarding the victim, the arrest, and any evidence found in both. So that's an easy case. Joe gets 50 years. And that seems good. That feels good, right, Captain? He gets 50 years for the attack. For the attack on Rita Kemper, on the on the the woman that thankfully got away from him. Yeah. The thing here is when I was when I was writing down this sentence that he got sentenced to 50 years, something immediately popped in my head and I have to bring this up with you cuz I know you're you're a fan. I recently read one of Robert Kessler's, I'm sorry, Robert Ressler's books. Uh-huh. Uh I was inspired to do so because of the, the show mind hunter on Netflix. Yeah. You and I both loved the mind hunter. Yeah. I, I didn't love it at first. I, I think it was like the f- first episode. I, I thought the main character was, I was like, yeah, I'm not really into this guy by the second episode. I'm not a huge car guy, even though I own a garage, um, the cars in the show from the time period. And then it was his partner, the old school cop, the old school detective, Bill. Yeah, Bill. He grew on me. Um, much like the captain would grow on you. If you <laughs> no. But then by like the third episode, I was in love with everybody. Uh, and I just think it's a amazing show. The first, I'm getting a little off track here, but the, the first uh, episode opens up with that hostage scene where the, the hostage taker ends up blowing his own head off. And that, boom, hey, I was hooked right there. Hey, spoiler. spoiler it's, it's a season-long thing that's like the first 10 minutes yeah, of the... Hey, spoiler. It, okay, so here's... Send hate mail to here's the Nick deal. I was reading truecrimegarage.com. I was reading a book by Robert Ressler. Okay. And the reason why I did this is I'm not certain. I'm not 100% certain, but you had mentioned the older agent, Bill. Right. Who eventually recruits Holden to the BSU, right? I believe Bill's character is based off of the real life person, Robert Ressler. So having watched this, it inspired me to go back and read one of Ressler's books. And in one of them, this is not a direct quote, but trust me, this is very close. He's talking about punishing criminals. And of course, throughout his career, he has faced and been involved in conviction in the conviction process of probably the absolute worst people that you can imagine. Yeah. He says in his book, unfortunately we live in a time where the sentence of death doesn't always mean death. Life doesn't always mean life. And 25 years can mean 12 or even six. 
Yeah. So just keeping that in mind, I think is important here because I, I'm quick too to go, well, we're taking a man that's in his forties and we're giving him 50 years in prison. And that's the same as locking him up and throwing away the key when in reality it's absolutely not. So it's very important that we have these other two trials for Joseph Matheny to face justice for the murders of these other two women. The second and the third trial will be different because in those trials, Joe is charged with murder and facing the death penalty in each of the cases. The first murder trial is for the murder of 23 year old Kimberly Spicer. Joe was possibly facing the death penalty because the prosecutor was charging him with not only murder, but with robbery and sexual assault. It was necessary for the prosecution to prove robbery or sexual assault in addition to the murder in order to get that death penalty under Maryland law. Defense lawyers called a surprise witness in an effort to help Joe avoid the death sentence. This was Baltimore homicide detective Homer Pennington that we had mentioned earlier, the lead homicide detective who investigated the gruesome killing. He was asked, did Mr. Metheny discuss his necrophilia acts with you? To which Pennington said, yes. The lawyers, this is, this is one of the strangest things I've ever come across in, in, in trials here. But the lawyers are trying to show that Joe does not deserve the death penalty because he did not commit an aggravating crime such as sexual assault and then murder the woman. Right. They called the detective to make a bizarre but important point that Joe preferred to have sex with dead women and necrophilia is not considered a crime in the state of Maryland. That's ridiculous. Just kind of just kind of sit and soak that in for a minute. Yeah. Well, it should be. So listen to this. They should just say pause the trial. Hey, by the way, that's now a new law. Hey, can we, can we get voters to come out and just put this into into the process immediately? Yeah. Necrophilia should be a crime. Yes. Everywhere. Yes. That it ain't is. right. Anyway, <laughs> so his defense lawyers, they did not contest the claim that Joe perform, per, performed a sex act with Spicer's body, but this was after her death. Right. In fact, they added that, that Metheny violated Spicer with a bottle after she was dead, but they denied that he had sex with her while she was alive. All right. Well, another strange part to this trial, the defense attorneys considered calling Spicer's mother to the stand as a witness. We don't need to call her. Well, this is what's, For what? this is what's strange about it. Okay. J- Joe then persuaded them not to call her. He reportedly told the attorneys, please do not do this. Spicer's mother, this is uh, Kathy, Kathy Price, was not called to the stand. It's just so crazy to me, all these serial killers that have issues with their mothers. I well, mean, it's just over and over, right? Yeah, and uh, but you're talking about he did some horrible things to this Kimberly Spicer. Right. And then he, he's, it's almost like, he, okay, to do what he did, you, you basically, I don't think you can have remorse. If you do what he did and then you did it again to somebody else. Right. I don't see any any form of remorse there. However, him crying at the trial when she when she's to be called and saying, "Hey, don't do this," then you start to question: Is he remorseful? Is he you know sad about what he did? Is he sad for this victim, for the mother's victim? Well, I think for the victim of his mother. I'm not saying that right at all. It's a mother of a mother. I'm, I'm trying to say the the victim's mother that maybe he felt bad for the victim's mother. No. I go ahead. Right, but I possibly, but uh, also with the whole situation with his mother, you know, he seems like somebody that's stuck in his past, and maybe by that bringing being brought up to that forefront, that maybe he, this is going to sound weird, but maybe on some way psychologically he's reverted back to a time where he wasn't this crazy piece of shit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Back in a time where maybe he was a sweet child. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And that kind of goes, you know, a lot, there's a lot of arguments are killers born, you know, or they are, are they made? And it's probably just more selfish than wanting to spare 
uh, Kimberly Spicer's mother, the agony of going on the stand. It's probably more selfish in just that it bothered him, that it made him upset. And he's saying, hey, don't do this. Right, right. Now, I, I did make a, I misspoke earlier, Captain. Kimberly Spicer was stabbed 26 times. That was the cause of her death. Joe was found guilty of first degree murder in her horrific murder. Right. But he was spared the death penalty by the judge who ruled that Joe did not rob or sexually assault the woman before he killed her. Now, a day after escaping the death penalty, Joseph was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. After the trial, Kim Spicer's mother said to reporters, I'd like to ask him why he killed Kim. Right but stating that we will never really know. He's just a killer. And some people there is just evil. Yeah. But did she ever ask him? I don't think she ever had a conversation with, with Joe, uh, outside of the courtroom. Well, and he also liked to write people. So I don't, you know, but that would be a sign of remorse to write a letter to the victim's mother. I just don't think he has that in him. The second murder trial took place about five months later. And again, Joe was facing the death penalty. This time he is accused of killing uh, Kathy Magaziner, who was decapitated. Her decapitated body was found on the grounds of Joe Stein and son pallet company. Now she was, she was also decapitated post-mortem. Yes. And I should stop myself here and add that Joe was actually facing three murder charges in three separate cases, originally charged with two, but once those trials were set, law enforcement, they then, then identified a third body in connected it to this case. This was Tony Lynn Ingracia. She was only 28 years old at the time of her death. Her father, John, described Tony simply telling reporters that she was a good girl. She had some problems with drugs, but she was trying to get help. And I hate to report this here, but there's very little out there on this case. All that I could find is that, um, she, she, okay. So her body was found basically dumped on the side of a road. Right. And when he was arrested, they connected this case to him. I don't know what evidence they used to connect him to this case. My guess. Sometimes they don't use any evidence. They just go, this guy's behind bar. Maybe. He did this one. Well, and I'm kind of throwing this in as a side note that he was charged with this third murder because right. eventually it's thrown out. They, they drop the charges due to insufficient evidence. Yeah. They couldn't take it to trial. Right. And my guess here is that, is he connected to it? We may never know, but I know that her case is still unsolved as far as I could see. If anybody can find any information on that, make sure you post it on our blog at truecrimegarage.com. But I'm guessing, Captain, that it's a simple thing that she was probably running around in in circles that Joe may have been running around in. Possibly. And uh, she may have had connections to that area that he was known to frequent. Right. But it's also, look, you're going to the bar, you're drinking, you're doing drugs, you know, something like cocaine. That's a very social drug. So then your circle becomes wider and wider. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is I think it's just a simple thing that she fits the victimology of Joe. Yeah. And he's he's locked up. He's certainly capable of it. Let's go ahead and charge him with it. Meanwhile, we can't find any evidence to support our theory. Well, and also maybe their thought was, hey, let's charge uh, Joe with it because he's also a guy that starts speaking. That's true. And and it could be as simple as, hey, we believe that you are uh, responsible for this murder of this young lady. And he just goes... Yeah, and this is what happened. Yeah, and, and then it's an open and you know open and shut case. Um, but you know I don't know. That's clever. I didn't think of that. I didn't. I, didn't I mean, because what does it hurt? It, they. Yeah, you can always charge somebody else with it. Exactly. So in Joe's second murder trial, the murder of Catherine Magaziner, uh, this should be a pretty open and shut case as well. Because remember, just after Joe was arrested for Kim Spicer's murder. Three days later, he led police to a shallow grave on the property, which held the decapitated remains of Kathy. Now, one thing that I want to point out here, Captain, is why they have the person take them to the body. And we we know it obviously is this on the surface. 
that we need to locate this body right so we can charge this individual with the actual murder but it's essentially a confession right i mean well in I what buried they her over there right and but what they do the reason why they bring a person like joe to the actual body is that later if he decides he wants to recant his confession they can still say in court well, yeah, we can't use your confession against you, but right. you were the one that physically led us to this body. Right. Like like I said, it's almost like uh, a second confession. Um, not, one that they can't the take one. away. Exactly. So some highlights from this trial. The uh, final prosecution witness was an FBI agent. This oh, is nice. James Fitzsimmons. Sounds, and, <laughs> sounds like an FBI agent. Yeah. Oh, James Fitzsimmons works for the FBI. He told the bureau he told how the bureau had been investigating a range of alleged criminal activities coming from the Joe Stein and Sons company hmm. when they received a tip that Metheny had been harboring a corpse. These are his words. Now, the defense attorney, in my opinion, Joe had very good counsel at his trials, which I was a little surprised. Yeah. Forgive me out there if this is rubbing anybody the wrong way for me being surprised, but we're talking about a drug addict that has no money. I mean, he was working, making seven or $8 an hour as a forklift operator, getting paid an extra $20 a week and blowing all of his money on drugs and alcohol. Well, and these crimes are horrendous and he is confessing to them in multiple ways. So what great defense attorney is going to step up and say, Hey, maybe I'll help this guy. And if, and, and these are cases that you're going to lose. You know you're going to lose them. Yes, and but from his attorney's actions, I I'm just saying I'm giving it a grade A. I think that he had good representation. He had and, better representation than like Adnan Syed. And well, and like you said, these are losing cases. So your whole your whole battleground here is to make sure he doesn't get killed. He doesn't get the death penalty. Right. So and that's probably why they jumped on board. It was probably somebody that is against the death penalty. That's true. And should not be in our legal system. And they said, hey, you know what? I'm going to step up and I'm going to defend th that principle, not right. defend this monster, but I'm just going to try to get it, you know, where he doesn't get the death penalty. His attorney's name was Margaret Mead. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm giving her a great A, I should at least mention her name. Uh, one yeah. thing she did during the course of the trial was she questioned uh, the FBI agent about payments that the FBI made to the owner's son of the pallet company. Huh. Uh, yeah, and they also made payments to this William Ashbrook. Remember, he was the guy that had called, had told police, this guy asked me to help move a body for him. Right. Okay, so it goes like this. Um, they, She brought up a report that showed the FBI had spent approximately $25,000 on Ashbrook's behalf. This was, they paid him to go to a drug rehabilitation program. They paid for well, they didn't pay him to go there. They paid right, for right, the right, right. program itself. And they covered his rent uh, for some time while he went into hiding as co a cooperating witness. The FBI also reimbursed the owner of a house where Ashbrook had once stayed, and the owner accused him of stealing tools valued at $5,000. I, I don't fault them for doing that. I mean, because at the end of the day, they're getting evidence, but they're also not just handing this guy money. They're trying to straighten out this guy's life. Mm -hmm. And they probably said, hey, look, you have a drug problem. Yeah, I got a drug pro problem. Hey, for for you helping and cooperating with us, we're going to try to get you clean. Right. And we're going to do so by sending you to rehab, but we're also going to pay your rent for a while so you have nothing to worry about while you're in hiding from this 300 and some pound, you know, monster of a dude. Yeah. The FBI also spent about $94,000 to relocate Joe Stein Jr. and his family after he began cooperating with the investigation. Well, that's a little excessive. I think that, um, yeah, so they're kind of they're kind of protecting these people from a guy that's locked up. Um, yeah. I, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just pointing out something that I found interesting in the trial. I guess the the attorney was possibly trying to imply that they paid these two in some form to testify against her client. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a reasonable argument. Uh, whether or not you can prove that is another thing. I think it's fair to bring it up at the course of the trial. Yeah. 
Counsel also was asking the jury to spare the death penalty because Joe was addicted to drugs and that the slayings occurred while he was under the influence of heroin, cocaine, or alcohol. And pointing out that Joe has a good deal of remorse for what he has done, his attorney stated that Joe said he wanted the killings to stop. She added that he's very polite, respectful, and intelligent. He understands far more than most people. It's very indicative that when he is under the influence of various narcotics, that that is when there seems to be a personality change. Joe himself described this as a rage that comes forward through drugs. He described this as being very frustrated with his life, being very frustrated too about how he grew up and all of the life experiences he had had. Yeah, Joe Metheny seems like a guy that's just stuck in a prison of his past. Yeah, and the thing, Captain, is this. You know, I went through a couple of the quote-unquote highlights of the trial, but the, the strangest thing that happened in the trial was after Joe was found guilty. This is where Joe decides to address the jury. And, I mean, this cannot be a smart move at all, but you you can't make this guy stop, right? He addresses the jury, and I'm not going to give any direct quotes, but he starts telling them that they should kill him. They should sentence him to death because he is not sorry for what he has done. He will never be sorry for what he has done. He then goes on to describe digging up the skull of one of his victims, saying that he made love to it. Yeah. Then he's telling the jury that he is happy to go to hell for his crimes. And he talked about when he when, when the uh, medical examiners had performed the autopsy on another one of his victims, that they had found that she had, and this is his terrible words here, that she had given birth to a bouncing baby beer bottle. That was his way of describing the bottle right. that the medical examiner had found. So... He was facing the death penalty, and I'm happy to report that he got the death penalty. Yeah. Kind of a weird thing, though, because, you know, he comes out, he confesses, then he cries at trial. Maybe shows some sign of remorse, and maybe he was smart enough to know if I address address the juries, and maybe it was as simple as this person's trying to defend me, but they're only trying to defend me because they don't want the death penalty and they don't believe in the death penalty, but they don't give a shit about me. Mm-hmm. And you know, well, I hate women. So fuck her too. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm going to throw this whole trial, right? That's well, possible. Or he's saying, I have to live with myself and I'm such a gigantic pile of dog manure that, I don't want to live anymore. So I'm going to say these horrible things, whether or not, you know, that's just for somebody to decide, you know, does he believe in what he's saying or does he not? It's possibly a a suicide wish from him. I could see that with the depressing statements that he's made over the years. Um, One thing though, I question is everyone that describes Joe, they describe him as a smart and, and intelligent man, right? Here's what I wonder, Captain, having already received 50 years for kidnapping and then a life without the possibility of parole sentence in the first murder trial. So then they add that now he's facing the death penalty again and he's been convicted, but, but not sentenced. He goes to the jury and puts on this whole crazy role. I'm wondering if that was some plan inside of his head that he's like, well, maybe I can convince these people that I'm crazy that during the course of this trial, I'm going to show that I'm remorseful. I'm going to have my attorney point out that I'm remorseful, that I was addicted to drugs and the drugs caused me to kill people. And when it's all said and done, if I have my last card to play is the crazy card. Yeah. And I mean, nobody in their right mind would get up and say the things that he said to the jury. So, well, like you said, he's, I mean, he is not human. Yes, and but but I have so many questions about Joe, though, because he's also one of these guys that comes off as defiant to the end for me. Maybe this is just a, oh, well, you got me. There's nothing I can do about it, so I'm going to rub your faces in it for a while while I can. And 
until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.